Thank you for the panel for invitation and Dr. Oshlin for allowing me to present this case. So I'm presenting a 46-year-old female uh, who's a mustard patient with a progressive RV failure. She's born with detransposition of great arteries with a restricted atrial septal defect at birth, underwent a septectomy on day three, subsequent mustard operation at two and a half years of age, so total two median sternotomies. She did very well throughout childhood without any problems, four pregnancies, first two pregnancies from first marriage at 26 and 28 years of age, no complication throughout the pregnancy, healthy children. The third pregnancy from second marriage, she was at 31 years of age, no problems during pregnancy, healthy baby, but on day four of the postpartum, she developed first symptoms of symptomatic heart failure. So fourth pregnancy, unfortunately, ended up with miscarriage twins. Arrhythmia history is not that significant, so one episode of AFib at age of 15, and our pediatric cardiology colleagues have started on DIG and left since then, and then she did fine. Heart failure history, as mentioned before, her first symptomatic heart failure was at 31, postpartum day four. She was started on diuretics and ACE inhibitors. She did very well for the next 14 years, so second episode of symptomatic heart failure was at 45, where she self-increased the diuretics and did well without requiring any hospitalization. Now comes at age 46 with the third episode of symptomatic heart failure requiring admission. So on examination at this time, the patient has bilateral crackles and fetal edema clear heart failure signs. This is the chest X-ray at the time of this admission showing cardiomegaly, some mild pulmonary venous congestion, and also small bilateral pleural effusions. Apart from elevated BNP, the rest of the blood work was unremarkable. This is the ECG which shows normal sinus rhythm with right bundle branch black pattern with a QRS duration of 154 milliseconds. So I'm gonna highlight, this is the echocardiogram. The bottom echo images are from the current admission and the top images are three years before. I just wanna emphasize that the RV size has progressively increased in the past three years. The function is severely reduced, as it is, and the tricuspid valve regurgitation has progressed from mild to moderate to severe. We also appreciate flow acceleration in the SVC baffle concerning for baffle stenosis. The further images at the time of the admission shows this, an incidental finding of RV apical thrombus. I also wanted to put these other pictures showing that there are no other valvar issues. Uh, so, with this finding, what do we do? I have to take this case a little different approach because there are several steps that we have to have panel opinions here. So thus, this would be the first one. So how would you manage RV apical thrombus? Would you proceed with surgical thrombectomy, thrombolytic therapy, or standard anticoagulation? Well, the four last option is at least for heart transplant as hap. Okay, so we have a very... Uh, complex problem here, a patient's failing mustard procedure, mm -hmm. uh, severe systolic dysfunction of the subaortic artery with heart failure, severe TR, and the thrombus in the right ventricle, the apex. So the question is, these are the options which are available. So what would be your approach? I mean, I, I mean uh, the first thing you have to do, in my opinion, is just give anticoagulations. I mean, then you deal with other things. I mean, while dealing with other things, you have to start anticoagulation. I'm not sure you have given enough. For thrombolytic therapy, you have to have some hemodynamic compromise. Or and embolic event. An embolic event or something. But this, no. you can just start heparin, and, and you might see improvement in the thrombus. But that's what I would, first thing, I would do, anticoagulate. No. I think we did the same thing. No. Just one question. For, uh, just a moment, please. Go ahead. This patient has AFib at age 15. She was on digoxin. When would you consider anticoagulation these patients, in these TGA patients with atrial arrhythmias? Why wasn't she already at now on, on morphine? That's my question. Uh, so at that time when she came to us, she was not on any anticoagulation. She had this episode when she was under pediatric care, and she was not on any anticoagulation. But as a rule, and if a patient with a mustard or senic procedure does have episodes of eight arrhythmias, this patient should be anticoagulated. Yeah, definitely. But I, I know, and I, I don't see pediatrics, but I know in the pediatric world, they don't see that much strokes and thromboembolic events in their patient. That's why, maybe why they're not giving thromb 
uh, anticoagulation, but we know in adults, you, there is no question. You yeah. have to give it. But also the other question, I think the patient came to us at the age of 20 or 25, and she hasn't had any arrhythmias at the age. Uh, yeah, she has an anterior adulthood, and the question is, then you need to balance the risk-benefit of anticoagulation, anticoagulation as, a, as a risk of major bleeding. Yeah, I, think, I think she should have been on anticoagulation at some stage prior, but the thrombus is in the wrong spot anyway. At this, at, at this stage, it's in the effect of the ventricle. That's really, I think, I think you've got the transplant ASAP over there, but I, <laughs> I think you're heading in ASAP in that direction pretty soon. <laughs> do, you give, do you give them vitamin K antagonist or NOAX? I think in this situation you should definitely, for the long term, you give some vitamin K antagonist, but in, in this patient, could, could he be or she be on, a, on NOAC? What is your approach then in Toronto? So I think this patient is not a candidate for a NOAC because of thrombosis. There's no danger. No, no, yes. But if she has a, just a history of arrhythmia to prevent the uh, embolic events, I think uh, this patient could be a candidate for a NOAC. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's so, move forward. So what did we do? So we followed with the standard anticoagulation, start on the low molecular weight heparin, transition to oral warfarin. So in four weeks, the thrombus disappeared and no uh, systemic embolic events. So the rest of the hospital course, she did really respond well with IV diuretics. Her symptoms of heart failure improved very well, and she was subsequently discharged and referred to a ACHD heart failure clinic with plan for full workup. So our discharge medications include, as you can see, it's a typical heart failure regimen. So Lasix, Dish from the, for the AFib, it's been on it. And Lisinopril, she was been on it since 31 years of age. And the Carvedilla, we start on a low dose. So subsequent cardiac catheterization, I'm just going to take a step here slowly. So looking at the SADs, we have an SVC SAD of 72%, your PS SAD 76, systemic SAD 88. So you have some right to left shunting with QPQS 0.69 is to 1. You also have a mean SVC pressure of 13 and a systemic venous atrium pressure of 10. So you have three millimeter gradient across the SVC baffle. There's no gradient across the IVC baffle. There's some high, uh, high filling pressures here, but normal pulmonary artery pressures. You also have a high pr mean pressures in the pulmonary venous atrium and also the secondary to severe tricuspid regurgitation. So these are the angiograms where you see both a baffle leak and at the same time a baffle stenosis of the SVC. The IVC baffle looks very well without any leaks or obstruction. So subsequently underwent a cardiac MRI where you can see this RV is severely enlarged with the RV volume index of 206 ml per meter square, severe RV dysfunction with the EF of 22, well-preserved subpulmonary ventricular function and baffle obstruction, which you're already aware of. So these are serial cardiopulmonary study uh, in the past three years before this admission. So as you can see, uh, there is a gradual decline in her exercise capacity. A 48-hour Holter monitoring showed uh, four runs of non-sustained VT, no episodes of syncope, and uh, blood works in the heart failure clinics showed continued rise in the BNP and her PRA, she's hypersensitive to 100%. So with this data, what we have, what do you recommend? Would you continue medical management plus address the baffle stenosis, or would you consider a cardiac resynchronization therapy here with the uh, criteria what we have, uh, plus address the baffle sending prior to that? Would you consider tricuspid valve replacement in a mustard? Is there a stage double switch is an option, or you just proceed with heart transplant? Is, is there also a possibility to 2A if, if maybe um, cardiac resynchronization with an AC, ICD is this also an option? Mm -hmm. Then I would go for 2A. Well, I mean, this is the same like the first case. You have, we have no idea which one is causing the problem because you have multiple issues that you identified right. in the ventricular dysfunction, the TR, and which is secondary, and then you have the baffle stenosis. But, you know, do we see baffle stenosis? Sure. And do we see the residual shunt? Right. But so what's the main problem here? It looks like it is in a DTGA like this, it is the ventricle that is the most important really? culprit. Yeah. Right. And you... And what else can you do? I mean, CRT D uh, is a good option with uh, with stenting. If you can stent it 
if you can stent it well, if you have somebody who can do it. Particularly with this patient being very highly sensitized, having her chances of getting transplant or waiting times is so long, but any way that we can optimize her hemodynamics would probably the prefer approach, I guess, everyone would choose. I think we chose the same. Um, moving to the next one, so would you consider AICD in this patient, as I know, with the short runs of non-sustained VT and a severe RV dysfunction? So you said it, so it's an EF of less than, I mean, if you're going to consider the guideline for the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, yes, less than 35% NOIH class two or more, you, and you have already non-sustained VT. Just non-sustained VT. And you know if, if I mean, this is a bad, hmm. when you have, in, a, in a mustard, when you have heart failure, it doubles your sudden cardiac risk by four, uh, by four times it multiplies right. it. Hmm. So you know already, and you have atrial arrhythmia, right? So mm -hmm. one more risk factor for sudden death, and he has a white QRS. Mm -hmm. So right. she have everything that speaks for sudden death. Right. So ICD yeah. is mm -hmm. not a. Is I not think even, you, need, not you also need to consider, think of a big picture of this patient. What are the options? Yeah. The, the the options to get the heart is very very low. So you actually need take you need go, go to the whole menu of what's available electrical therapy, medical therapy, to improve the symptoms, that's the goal, to improve the symptoms and quality of life. This patient may also improve the risk of right. or reduce the right. risk of sudden cardiac death. I, I, I agree with Nasser. I think this is very reminiscent of the first case, right? I mean, the, 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 the elephant in the room is your, your ventricle. I mean, you can, we can certainly palliate and do all, everything else that we just talked about. It. I think you're, you're looking at that ventricle as as being the problem, so the question really is going to be coming down to transplant at some stage. Right. I suspect putting the, tra the tricuspid valve in in an EF of what, what was it, 10 percent or 50, uh, you know, that's probably not the not the surgical approach to think of. So if you look at that list of uh, options you put in there, I mean, I think palliate her as much as you can, but then the big picture really is going to be good. A TR in this patient is more functional. Sure, TR. sure. It's completely different from the LTGA. Right. So yeah, I won't. I mean, yeah, no, that's exactly that's exactly my point. Is that you know you've got you've got a you've got a dilated dysfunctional ventricle, so the tricuspid valve replacement is really not the option that, to be looking at. You're looking at medical therapy palliation and then going down that route. So if you're going to go the route of CRTD, which is what we're thinking, then you have to just explain to the patient what it means. At first, if you have somebody that would do it with the lowest risk possible because it's not always that easy. Right. But the, the patient how, uh, has to understand what it means to have an, an ICD with the uh, you know, fleet failure, appropriate shocks, right. and inappropriate yeah. shocks, and everything else. So it's not surprises that they get, don't surprise, they're not, they don't get surprised by it. No. Right. So, let us keep in mind that he got it. Oh yeah, Michael. Uh, uh, one question is, what data do you have that CRT is going to be of any benefit yes. whatsoever in somebody with a systemic right ventricle? and a right bundle branch block morphology, given that there is no data that right bundle mm -hmm. branch morphology works with um, conventional CRT therapy. And second question is, given that her transplant risk is significant with her uh, PRA positivity, what about destination yeah. uh, systemic ventricular uh, support, so as a BAD, okay. as yeah. destination therapy? Okay. Then. So to your question number one, you're completely right. There's no data whether or not CRT uh, improves the outcome in patients with a subiotic RV or yeah, subiotic RV. It's different than a subiotic LV, but this patient there's no data. But if you think of the big picture, what are, what are the options for this poor lady? The, the options are very, very limited and actually and if you want to help this lady, you need to take a very individualized approach. Uh, go to the menu, what's available. Go through the risk of the different options, like stenting, the baffle, CRTD, what's the benefit, what are the risks, what does it mean, appropriate shocks, inappropriate shocks, what do, what do you do when this patient and really develops end-stage heart failure. This is a question to turn off the, the the, the defibrillator. So those are all these very questions which have to be answered and discussed with the patient before you implant an AICD. Definitely. I mean, the only data that we have for CRT is in the LTGA who get paced and then you have worsening dyssynchrony in the 
systemic ventricle and worsening TR sometimes. This is where CRT will likely synchronize the ventricles and improve synchrony and, vent and ventricular function. So this is an LTGA, but definitely not in a DTGA mustard or setting. You know, Erwin, I, I completely agree that, that you're limited, but anyway, it, it's, it's a bit uh, experimental if you go with the CRT. So sometimes maybe we also have to accept things how they are and that uh, maybe we just have here um, talk about transplantation, end of life issues, palliative care, etc. But just doing something and maybe it's good because also we may harm patients when we just try things that are not proven. Yeah, I completely agree. In these patients, with this population, there are no data. There are anecdotal experiences. But even if in acquired heart disease, yeah, we are implanting TAVIs in <laughs> 88, 90 year old patients. That was the question what are we doing? Also, how many years of life do we gain also when I implant, implant the valve? But I implant the valve maybe not to prolong life, but to improve quality of life. Yeah, that's but, a hard thing. Well, one out of four of the TAVIs patient die within a year, so it's not, I mean, yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. We have one more question, yeah. I just have a comment on the whole, uh, the big picture. I have some concerns about running a hemoglobin on 132 and the oxygen saturation of 88 due to right-left shunting. Does she have a severe iron deficiency? Uh, no, from the labs, no. But that's a good question. Okay, so... Maybe. So what did we do? Okay, we, did, we did address the baffle. We did close the baffle leak. We uh, opened up the baffle with, by stunting, and subsequently we did CRT implantation. So three months from there, how, so this is basically the angiogram showing the baffle leak closure by device and subsequently stunting of the SVC baffle. This could have been approached by some of the colleagues by covered stent as well, but this is the way it was chosen here. Let me just make a comment at this stage. It's not only realized to this patient, but to all patients with a baffle stenosis. So a baffle stenosis can be the reason for a sudden cardiac death in a patient with an atrial switch procedure if this patient presents with an atrial arrhythmias because this subpulmonic LV is starving and the preload is reduced. If these patients have a, a, a tachycardia with a very short diastole, there's no feeling or poor feeling of the ventricle and the low cardiac output. This can be a mechanism of certain cardiac death in some of these patients. Mm -hmm. So three months post-CRT, how is the patient doing? So clinically declining due to functional class three. So you can see the medications doses have been optimized further. You can also appreciate the ACE inhibitor has come off. Again, we don't have a data as we have seen all from the morning lectures. Uh, so this is the EKG post-CRTD. You can clearly say she's not a responder. So you can see by the pacing rhythm and uh, your QRS duration is much wider than to 184 milliseconds. So pre-CRT and post-CRT echo, you may, it may appear that RV size may be smaller compared here, but still severely reduced function. So we did another cast since the patient was declining and now you notice elevated PA pressures post-CRT your RV EDP is elevated to 25, and uh, still you have good cardiac output and the PVR less than three, so. And serial blood loss continue to rise with the BNP, despite all the medical therapy options what we did try so far. Now, what do we do? So list the patient for heart transplant status 4S. What does that mean status 4S in Canada? Is any patients who had a PRA more than 80% will be listed as status 4S and then wait? We do list the patient for heart transplant and desensitize. Do not list the patient to heart transplant and manage conservatively. Consider other options such as take down mustard and arterial switch or VAD as a destination therapy slash bridge to transplant. So how good is the center in desensitization and before transplantation versus, versus destination VAD? So how good are we with desensitizing these patients. So in Toronto, they have quite a good experience in patients with a quiet heart right. disease to desensitize patients before or during heart transplant during the procedure. Uh, I, I'm not the specialist for that, but I know they have quite good experience and they have a multidisciplinary team who is actually 
doing research is addressing this problem. Uh, I raised this question. I have a patient who is in... But it's, it's not this... It's there are anecdotal experiences. Yeah. Other. I know because I have a patient in the hospital, three years plus now in the hospital, a failing Fontaine uh, with a liver problem who, who has a high values and we try to desensitize and it's not working that well. But it is, I mean, it really depends whether desensitization would work and make, her, make the patient more to be on the list. Uh, I mean, this patient is like one of those who will stay on the list unless they drop off the list until they get the, the heart. There's, there's no doubt it's always failing. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, yeah, should we just accept the natural history of this patient or should we uh, address any uh, experimental approaches. What about the destination therapy, Ali? Oh, so right. Thank you. For instance, destination, ther as a destination right. therapy. Right, that, that's the option. Even before you put these uh, options in, that was coming to my mind was um, uh, VAD as a, as a destination. Um, and then I was thinking de desensitization uh, um, as, as an ongoing process and see if that is something that can be done. But I agree. I mean, I, I think your options are pretty much going to be either a transplant or a, or, or a destination VAD. But I would really bring in the desensitization option in here. Just exhaust that option if you can. Mm -hmm. There is data for desensitization out there. I mean, centers are doing it, and it has been published, where even for congenital heart disease, um, that desensitization can be done. And in fact, I, I think I just recalled reading something recently even where, where it, has been, um, it has been done. So I think the options in my mind as I think about this is exhaust your desensitization, think of a VAD as a, as a, as a bridge, and then, and then go from there. Okay, so I think we have to move forward. So uh, okay. what happened now? So exactly the same lines. We listed the patient for trans, uh, 4S status and we did a RVAD implantation with the hardware 2 device. It came off pump nicely. Uh, for a week to two weeks of hospital stay, she was able to be discharged home. Uh, she stayed on the VAD for 21 months with no VAD, with significant VAD complications. She was even able to go to work. And uh, luckily, she, there was a donor available with a very weak positive virtual cross match. So successfully underwent heart transplantation. Uh, patient had a plasma exchange during bypass and post bypass. And uh, patient continues to show no signs of any rejection and clinically still doing well uh, from transplant perspective. Uh, I just want to quickly show brief slides how we approach at Toronto with the ACHD heart failure clinics. I think identifying these patients early and recommending to heart failure clinics is crucial. Uh, we do uh, refer these patients, anyone with heart failure symptoms in patients and outpatient admissions, and also patients of Fontan who are considering for Fontan conversions will be referred to heart failure clinics, and any discussions for advanced heart failure options those patients will be referred. The main thing to improve outcomes and research data. So this is the data from our group which has been uh, uh, in review right now. So uh, this is the, between the period of 2012 to 2015, all the ACHD heart failure patients were being reviewed. The total of 126 patients, and you can see four anatomic subtype groups, biventricular circulation with systemic LV, biventricular circulation with systemic RV, single ventricle and cyanotic. I know we're talking about systemic RV circulations. We have five patients who underwent VAD, uh, and there was one mortality out of that, and five transplantations. But overall, in a median follow-up of 1.7 years, there was a 10% mortality per year. We have 17% hospital admissions per year. There's also some things that the group identified, particularly the risk stratification in these patients. You can clearly see in this couple of may occur, the system Patients with biventricular circulation, systemic RVs are really doing poorly well compared to the rest of the three groups. Uh, the BNP has really shown to be an, a prognostic indicator. So the BNP in systemic RV category, anything more than 167 has really shown poor outcomes. And again, the endpoints on this study was death, transplant, VAD. That's what we're looking for. And the numbers of the BNP is even lower for single ventricles. So again, it's a multidisciplinary team approach. That's what leads to the patient's outcomes. And this is all the supportive data I had. And I acknowledge the Toronto Congenital Group for their dedicated service in these patients. And don't forget, save the date for next year, <laughs> International ACHD Symposium. Good job, everyone. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for this excellent case, and I think it really highlights the importance of the team approach. And I think the result you have shown in Toronto, that's an excellent result, but I guess, unfortunately, not all centers have the same team approach like you, have the same experience like you, so 
not all centers, I guess, will have this, uh, these excellent results like you have. Just one last thing, and then I, you have to close the session. I think one of the email, maybe you have also received an email about a questionnaire, and fill out the questionnaire about end of life and uh, advanced care planning. And what I've been struck by all these slides that we have seen three patients. In all patients, we talked about heart transplant, destination therapy, but on none of the slides was mentioned what was actually the patient's preferences. I think we all assume that the patients agreed that we undergo with heart transplant and VAD, but none of the slide was really mentioned when we first talked with the patient about its prognosis, about its perspective. And so I think the issue of end of life and also quality of life in these patients becomes more and more important. I'm really looking forward to see the results of the questionnaire we, ho we hopefully all have filled out. So with this, I would like to close this session.